now. So hello, we are beginning our panel conversation, Achieving Tenure and Promotion, Advice from Current School Psychology Faculty. And we, the plan for our time together is to have the panelists do some brief introductions uh, and then get to some submitted questions that were sent in when you registered for the session. And then we will stop this recording and ask if the current attendees have any questions that they would like to ask. And as I said, we won't be recording that section. So without further ado, to maximize our time together, I'm gonna go ahead and start us off with um, introducing you all to the panel or having them introduce themselves to you. And if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, uh, that would be great. And you're always welcome to send me questions or comments directly if you would like to, if you have a question that you would like me to share for on your behalf. Also feel free to use the chat to interact with one another as we go forward. So I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Vega in just a second, but I'm hoping that our panelists can tell us a little bit about um, your current institution, when you were tenured, and your institution's expectations around tenure and promotion. So for instance, what your teaching load is, what if there are any you know, publications per year expected, anything like that, are you research intensive, et cetera. So I'm going to mute myself and be here as moderator, but Dr. Vega, I pass it to you. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and thank you everyone for being here. This is a good turnout and looking forward to this discussion. Um, so I'm Desiree Vega. I have been at the University of Arizona since 2016. Um, I did start my career at Texas State University in 2013. Um, I got tenure in 2019. Um, and University of Arizona is a research one institution. Um, and so the teaching load is generally a two, two. Um, I've had many course releases throughout the years. And so I haven't actually taught a two, two, um, which has been great um, to manage the research expectations, which are, um, you know, I would say pretty rigorous. Um, they don't really, so part of the issue I'm, I'm sure we'll get into it, this is, you know, you don't get a, often get like, oh, you need to publish two articles per year. Um, and so there's not a lot of transparency in the process, which I think is unfortunate um, and can set folks up for failure. Um, so, you know, my strategy was to just publish <laughs> as much as possible and, you know, submit some grants along the way. Um, I will say that grants aren't as important. They want to see some productivity, but I know at some institutions you are very much expected to obtain a grant um, and they just want to see that activity and there's a higher um, weight as far as like publications, peer-reviewed publications. Great, Dr. Noltemeyer, you want to start? Sure, hi everyone. My name is Amity Noltemeyer. I'm a professor in the School Psychology Program and also Associate Dean in the Graduate School at Miami University, which is in Ohio. Um, I've been here for 11 years at Miami and I was, so I started in 2010. Um, I got tenure in 2015 and full professor in 2017. So it's a little bit of a quick turnaround on <laughs> between uh, associate and full. And I, let's see, our expectations. So we are a research two institution. Um, research and teaching are about equally uh, equal in terms of the percentage, um, you know, of time and effort and just the expectations there and then service being the third component that's evaluated. Um, we do annual evaluations and I was also a department chair for three years so I also did the the evaluations and the promotion tenure process from that perspective if, if there's questions about that. Um, there's annual evaluations that are tied to the promotion and tenure process so the same format that you use to go up for promotion and tenure you pretty much use kind of along the way each year and getting the feedback which is really nice. I think um, so that's a little bit i'm happy to answer more questions about the expectations as we go along. Great. Dr. Johnson. Hey everyone, thanks for inviting me and thank you for being here. Um, so my name is Austin Johnson. I'm at UC Riverside. I've been there. I had to write it down because I keep forgetting how long I've been here. I got here at 2015 for the 2015-16 academic year. So this is my seventh year. Um, I went up for tenure last academic year. So this is my first year as tenured faculty. So uh, that's exciting. So I went up in my sixth year. Um, UCR is an R1. 
Um, I'm in a small school of ed. Um, we have about, when I was hired, we had about 20 faculty. Now we have about 30. So we don't actually have individual departments. It's just the school, which is unique in so far as there's a lot of different groups, uh, a lot of qual folks, a lot of quant folks, a lot of there, we have some historians all evaluating and reviewing one another's files. And you see the UC system is also pretty unique in how evaluations take place in terms of faculty governance. I'm happy to explain more about that. Um, in terms of TNP expectations, research is certainly number one. Um, the informal guide that I was provided with was to a year um, with similar to what Desiree said, um, grant, interest in grants expected, but without sort of like, you need to have a large federal grant or a federal grant at all in order to, um, in order to achieve tenure. Um, my teaching load, so again, UC is very weird. We're on a quarter system. We have three 10 week quarters throughout the academic year, um, which is very interesting. So my load is four courses across those three quarters, which actually ends up being pretty good because it works out to be, you know, it can work out to be, to sort of work out in a lot of different ways, so. Awesome, welcome. And Dr. Van Norman. Hi everyone, I'm Ethan Van Norman. Uh, I'm at Lehigh University. This is my fourth year here, so I've kind of hit the tipping point. I was at Georgia State University for the first three years I was out, kind of similar starting time as Austin. And I had the experience of transitioning from a pretty intensive R1 institution to an R2 institution, but I would argue Lehigh is an R2 institution with R1 expectations within our college. And I'll talk about the good and bad of that um, as I've come to experience it. And kind of in contrast to some people, I've made this joke before with Lindsay on another Zoom. Um, we have very explicit criteria, which I just put in the chat, meaning that our college has gone to the nitty nitty gritty of tiers of evidence for teaching, research and service. And you'll look and it just seems to confuse you more, as I found out, of like, do you have to have one tertiary, one secondary, one primary? Um, I can talk about how I navigated that. But we were actually on a 3-2 load for historically, but the newest department chair has kind of put that default to 2-2. Two, two. And generally speaking, similar to Dr. Vega, I actually have bought, been able to buy out of a lot of courses with uh, some external funding, with external funding. But yeah, I couldn't get a specific number per year when I came in. And there's also ambiguity about if folks have changed institutions, I'm interested to hear what they say about like what you can bring in with you versus I've had colleagues that have had to functionally start over when they go to a new institution. And Lehigh was generally ambiguous and I really didn't know until right as I was going up of what actually was gonna count. So that was a little stressful. Definitely would keep me on my toes. Yeah. So we have three sort of subsets of questions for the panelists and then we'll get to Q and A from our audience. Um, so these were questions that you submitted when you registered. And the first set of questions is around just general tenure review processes. And so to start us off, I was hoping the panelists could reflect on how soon did you begin preparing your materials for your tenure packet or your tenure process? I can, I can start. Um, I would say, honestly, on day one, like the first day that you start, not that you're actually preparing your packet, but have some sort of organizational strategy that you're throwing, you know, maybe it's a Google folder or whatever it might be if your system, if your school uses, you know, Chalk and Wire or Faculty 180 or some system like that. Just, you know, as you get publications, as you get presentations, throwing them in there so that you have them. I personally like to update my dossier as I go. So like I said, we use the same format for our annual evaluation. So it's just building. So it wasn't this huge thing at the end, but even if your university doesn't do that, you know, as something gets accepted for me, I prefer to, as I get that notification, it feels good to go update it right then. Now, certainly that's not for your teaching philosophy statement. Those things, you know, those things happen kind of at the end summatively, but yeah, any little update you get, it helps me to just do that ongoing. I found that to be helpful. Um, you know, your teaching evaluations, all that as they come in. So I don't know, that's what I would say, but everybody has a different style. So that may not work for you. I find that I like to do it in chunks throughout the year. Like I inevitably forget to do stuff right after it happens. So, but I try to remember how painful it is to try to do it all at once, looking back, you didn't put anything, everything on your CV. So you need to go back to the emails. 
So I definitely agree that whatever your school's system is, we have a digital system that I think you, the UC system has has enacted, which actually is pretty pretty functional. It's pretty good. The teaching evals automatically upload into it. It's pretty straightforward. So, um, but yeah, absolutely. Like it just saves a lot of heartache to just keep it going as you go, in my opinion. Yeah, and for me, um, Texas State was pretty unique in that junior faculty had like a formal review every year and even twice in the second year. And so I pretty much had to, you know, compile, I had to do a statement every year, had to, you know, compile publications, uh, my teaching evaluations. So that really helped me get structured. Um, I think it was a little challenging when I transitioned to um, Arizona because it wasn't the same review process, um, but it was only really, you know, I was there for two years before I went up for tenure. Um, so it was easier in some ways to just, you know, update things and write like a more formalized um, statement. And not to say that process is easy because that was the hardest part for me, but I, I do think like record keeping is extremely important. Um, even when I went up for tenure in 2019, things were still paper. Um, and I, I think they've now moved to an electronic process, you know, as I shift toward thinking about full. Um, but like I update my CV like every month, you know, like, of course, early on, you might not have much to do. But now I'm like, you know, you do presentations a lot and those sorts of things like keeping the most updated copy um, really helps. It's like Austin said, a lot of things are going on and you just forget like, oh yeah, I submitted that paper. Oh, I was on that committee. Oh, I did a guest lecture. Um, and so keeping things, you know, whether it's in, you know, separate folder, your inbox in a separate folder, um, you know, when you get a new publication, like I have a publications folder. So I just drop things into there. Like it will help <laughs> tremendously in the long run. Yeah, I can just kind of echo a lot of the same sentiment because I had the opposite pattern where coming to Lehigh was much more structured. And we had to, I think the most stress inducing part of this, as many folks might anticipate, is the statements and contextualizing your evidence versus just the general task of compiling information. Um, for better or worse, Lehigh has a policy that every pre-tenure faculty is reviewed every single year for their annual review and every tenured professor reviews everyone's materials and provides a written letter that is then synthesized by the department chair. But to the point of technology, they're so paranoid about things leaking that the process is actually printed out. So they, like, if we have to go in and sign in and provide our edits now that I'm an associate professor on summary letters, it's bonkers. Um, so that being said, I really resented having to write statements at the beginning, but when it came time for the formal process, it was relatively straightforward in that I only had to expand upon maybe a paragraph or two in some of the areas. Um, we have an associate chair whose kind of role is to shepherd people through. But what I found, honestly, I can't speak too loudly. She's crossed the hallways. They're pretty good for tight copy editing, but not for content. So I relied on folks kind of not, not formally or informally mentoring, but to actually read the statements and see if it makes sense. Um, because one thing that I found out relatively quickly is I'm not as skilled as a teacher as I am as a researcher. So helping to contextualize some of my course evaluations was helpful. And when I found out, you know, that Dr. Shapiro had even lower historical ratings for this course, I didn't feel so bad. So figuring out and relying upon senior folks to help contextualize and kind of, which we'll talk about later, um, add some substance because we're a one department college. So we have all different areas represented within the promotion and tenure review process. So people down the hall have literally no idea what I do, but they're the most direct vote on my tenure case. And if I can add um, to the comment too, is, you know, at most universities, you have a third or fourth year review, which is your, you know, mini tenure review. And so, you know, collecting your evidence in years one and two will help for the, you know, the mid tenure review. And then once you get feedback from that, you know, when you go up for a tenure and, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh year, whatever it is at your institution or whatever your timing is based on your circumstances, it helps as well. Like you already have a framework to work off of to prepare like your final tenure and review packet. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you all so much. Um, so our next question, which I just highlighted to put in the chat as well is, 
this came up a lot in uh, registration questions, but how did you select your list of letter writers? And did you include any requests for individuals not to be selected? And if so, what was your primary consideration? I can start, I don't know, it's, it's a game of who goes first. So um, I, I can start, but I definitely don't need to. Um, as far as how I selected my letter writers, one thing I would say is just figure out what your university, first of all, requirements are. Like, for example, can you invite an emeritus faculty? Can you, in, you know, like, what are the rules? What type of, is there a rule about what type of institution they need to be from? Like for us, for example, if it's not an R2 or R1, we have to get special permission. Well, you probably want to like limit the number, you know, say that for like an exceptional case, if it's really, because you have to get provost approval and that sort of thing. So, so find out the bare minimum rules, but then also maybe find out the norms in your department, because even if it follows the rules for the university that doesn't necessarily mean that you know there may be other unwritten norms that you may want to consider that are within your department um, and then one thing i would say is because uh thinking ahead to going up for full one thing i didn't know when i went up for associate is no one really told me hey maybe you might want to save some full professors for when you go up for full and so i had all these full professors on my list and then when i went up for full a couple years later i was like oh i wish it was harder to find people when i was going up for full and i wish perhaps that I had not done that and that I would have focused on more associate level folks. That may not may or may not be the case for you. Um, and then I would just say, you know, as you meet people at conferences or, you know, talk to people that you know that have gone through this process um, or other people in your field, just kind of keep a list of ideas and ask your mentors and people who've gone through the process for ideas. As far as not asking anyone, I'd, or, you know, asking that someone not be used, I almost did that in my second, uh, in my full promotion review. And it was because I was the editor of a journal and I had to deal with an academic uh, plagiarism case. And I was just a little bit nervous about like if that person happened to get selected. But I, in the end, I decided that it was a very low likelihood this person wasn't really, you know, that closely related to my research. So I did not put in the request, but I did consider it. So that might be a case that you might think about if you had been involved in a situation like that where you had to um, deal with, you know, an accusation of plagiarism on behalf of someone who could become your external reviewer. Yeah, so it's, you know, I, I really would emphasize the importance of norms within where you are, like, because my, in my experience, I was told to really minimally look at associates, like if I have associates, make sure that they you have a really good reason for doing them for, but the most part, you really want to focus on full. There were, there are unwritten expectations around how many folks from within my system letters should be from. And then there's also the idea that I should write my letter with people that I think would be a good fit, but also make sure, yeah, write my, my list of people, but also keep some names off of that so that the committee can request names that I didn't put forward. So there was a there was just so much that I needed to learn from people who had been through the process before in order to really understand how to navigate it effectively. So for my in my experience, that was one of the most important things to figure out was just how to navigate those norms. Um, in terms of general ideas, like asking colleagues within the field, asking who is nice, asking who um, you know, some good advice that I got is that, you know, you can worry about people not necessarily writing you a great letter, but something to potentially expect is that hopefully folks would just decline writing you a letter rather than write you a really bad one. Um, I felt like I had something else I wanted to say around that. Um, oh, and not listing, not listing anybody. I did have someone that I put, I had one or two people that I put down. I was, you know, I, it didn't seem like there was going to be any consequences for me putting someone down in terms of the committee thinking that that was something negative about my file or that that was a red flag. It was more just do you want to put anyone down? So uh, I did just in terms of some professional interactions that made me uncomfortable that 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 person would not, those people would not be able to evaluate my work in a in a neutral way. So that was that was more or less my process. Yeah, so some other considerations that came up for me is that um, your external writers couldn't be someone that you collaborated with. And so I think as you know, many of you are navigating the early part of your career, thinking about who you publish with, especially publications. And again, like checking with your university's requirements. So 
you know, of course there were senior scholars that I look up to and I very much was like, oh, I would love to publish and collaborate and, you know, grants and things like that. But then thinking like after I get tenure <laughs> or maybe never because, you know, full professor is kind of the same um, issue. And so knowing like what the rules are around, um, you know, tenure at your university is really important to help kind of navigate the process. Um, some universities allow you to look beyond school psychology. My university did not, so they have to be in school psych. They couldn't be in special ed or, you know, counseling, nothing like that. So, you know, look into that as well. Um, I would say like this was really, really difficult for me because I do race and equity work, language work in school psychology, and I can count on one hand how many folks do this type of work, right? And then if we go broader to multicultural work in school psychology, and here's my cat, um, <laughs> of course, um, there's so few, especially at the senior level. And so then that made it challenging as well. And then I'm a qualitative researcher and we know there's not a lot of qual people in school psych. So it was really difficult to think about like who values the work I do in the field and who can actually write a strong letter for me. And so I, honestly, I was really concerned. Um, so, you know, like Austin mentioned, I worked with folks in the field. You know, one of my mentors here at U of A helped me. Um, I asked a full professor, a white man in school psych, and he was very much like, well, if you don't know this person, I wouldn't put him on your list. And so you know, that was eye opening to me as well. Like knowing, of course, knowing like who you can trust, who's going to give you an honest evaluation um, of who you should and shouldn't put on the list um, is important. And then what's the process? So I had to submit a list, a list of like, I don't know, six people. And then um, since my department chair was in another field, she asked Gina, you and my colleague here to provide a list. And so I talked with Gina about you know, who would be a good person to put on her list and my list. And then I met with my department chair and she was very clear about who she was going to ask. And we were in agreement. So it was a, a good process. It wasn't just like, we're going to send this without your input. So I did appreciate that. Um, so I didn't have to really worry about them coming up with a name that I wasn't comfortable with. Yeah, I was going to say, I kind of got exposed to the game within the game for the promotion tenure process. So we have to provide a list of 10 people. I get to choose five, my department colleagues choose five and the provost picks the final number. And kind of what I learned from some senior scholars here was that they're not gonna take all five of yours, they're not gonna take all five of mine. So give two or three of your top ones, two that you're kind of meh, and then tell me, tell us which ones you would strongly advocate for. Uh, because everybody in the college gets to weigh in, but then you kind of have your representative that kind of gets to facilitate that conversation. And so I kind of learned how to do that. And then I know we're being recorded, so I'll be a little bit more blunt than other folks, but people have gotten a reputation in our field for not writing good letters. So I would rely upon some senior folks in your college if you have them, just that and they'll be frank of not including those people or just kind of not formally requesting that they not be, but not let them enter the conversation informally on the list, which is a case that I had and I kind of knew um, so I'm an assessment researcher that doesn't own a measure. So I get all, you know threats of litigation. People sign reviews on journal articles for mine, kind of pretty much bullying a pre-tenure faculty member. So I had an idea of who I didn't want to be on there. Um, but I think just being transparent and finding somebody that you can trust that's going to be at the table for kind of the behind the scenes process. Um, and in Georgia State, it was basically <laughs> what it was explained to me is I would just sit down with the department chair and tell them who I wanted. So it was, like, it was a very different process here versus uh, where, where I was before. I think one thing I'd like to add real fast is that if you, I, you know, I came in, right now I'm the most senior person within my program. Um, that's been the case for quite a few years now at this point. No one else is really close to school psych in my, in my school. I relied, I relied, relied pretty much exclusively on people outside my university in order to figure out who to ask and what to do. But maybe you have a conflictual relationship with your former advisor, like maybe for reasons you're just, you feel stuck and like you can't ask people about how to get this information or you're not sure how to get this information. I think what I would encourage you to do then is like rely on, don't 
be don't be hesitant to ask for help from people maybe like you see here that are people that are clearly willing to talk to you about the promotion and tenure process that might be able to give you some of those resources. I just realized how isolating it could probably feel as having felt that to just sort of not, not know where to go in terms of getting that information. So um, if you feel like you're lacking those resources, I would, I would definitely do a little bit of, it's, it's okay to do a little bit of cold emailing or a little bit of like warm emailing and just get a sense of if you can get some support from somewhere else, from someone who seems pretty nice. Thank you, Austin, for that. I, I completely echo that point. And I'm not on the panel, but I just wanted to add, um, going back to the point about expectations, really being clear on it too, because we were discouraged from asking someone we had co-authored papers and articles with or chapters with, but it was okay if we had sat on a committee together for service. So just being clear on how close of a really, because it's hard to think about, well, who do I know in our small field um, that could really speak to my work? And if you've been in service commitments with others that might limit exactly who you can ask. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Thank you all so much. Those were really thoughtful answers. This was another very common question we received and um, I just picked one iteration or version of it. So how have you worked to find the balance between teaching, research, and service? This person wrote, teaching and service often have these discrete deadlines and tasks, which can sometimes make it hard to preserve enough time for research. But when I protect research time, I often end up having to catch up on teaching and service activities in the evening or on the weekends. Anyone happy can to, I am happy to start. Um, I still don't have balance. <laughs> nine years in the game um, and if anyone has a secret I would love to hear about it um, but thinking about you know the pandemic has really changed a lot of things for you know for all of us and you know how our time is structured and you know zoom has been great but it's also put a lot of demands right like everyone has, wants to have a zoom meeting about something whereas we probably wouldn't be doing that in person all the time but it's like you're more accessible. And so I think even like in this Zoom world, um, you know, I block my calendar off because I'm like, I don't want anyone thinking that just because my calendar appears to be open that I can have a meeting when that might be my writing time or when I'm prepping for class or my own just personal time, right? If I have an appointment or something. Um, and some things that have been working to some extent is um, like one day a week, I have a writing group with two friends and colleagues. Um, and so for four hours, you know, we have a four hour block. Um, so we meet once a week, have that four hours for our writing time. Um, of course, we're talking <laughs> during the time. So it's not four complete hours of writing, but just having that day dedicated so writing makes me feel like I don't have to think about teaching stuff right now. I'm, you know, off my email, not thinking about service stuff. And so that helps too. Um, I have a day dedicated to class prep. So, you know, Monday is my writing day. Tuesday morning, I try to get my teaching stuff done because I teach on Wednesday. And then I know my teaching day, like nothing else is really going to get done because there's other meetings and then reserving Thursday and Friday for like, if students need to meet with me, I use Calendly, which has helped a lot. So they can just go on my Calendly and pick a day and time that's open to meet with me versus like these back and forth. Um, so some of those things have helped. It's not perfect. Um, I will say something that I don't think is very popular in academia, but I have pretty firm boundaries and about not working at night and on the weekends. And it's not to say that I never work at night and on the weekends, um, and, but it's rare. And so I think figuring out how that could work for you, sometimes it means things don't get done, but I feel like there's an endless list. And even if I work every night and every weekend, I'm never gonna be caught up. And so that's kind of where I draw the line. Like, I think for me, my you know own sanity and mental health and, um, you know, a reminder that these universities will replace us in a second and we can't, you know, kill ourselves for this job. Like sometimes things got to get done. Like I understand that, but you also have to figure out where you draw the line in terms of when you're going to work and when you're not going to work. I've tried to like yell at my colleagues at schedule send is a thing. 
Like you don't need to send me something at Saturday at midnight or Saturday at 10 o'clock. Cause that's when you're working. Cause like to sort of the point, like I don't, I feel this compulsion to like respond to stuff when I get it. Uh, but like I started doing something like in my syllabus saying expect 48 hours for a response to students. And also I kind of have a preamble kind of related to setting boundaries, which I definitely agree with, especially now that I've got a son, like I don't like to work on the weekends or at night. Um, I, I put something in the syllabus, like I will never contact you after 5 p.m. on the weeknights and I will never contact you on Saturday and Sunday. So consider this when you have a question about an assignment and plan accordingly. Um, and I think too, personally, I think there's a blog post about this from way back in the archives. I found that just being okay with things in service and teaching not being perfect. Like good is, the, you know, just let it be good. It doesn't need to be absolutely perfect. And like I've talked to my dean and I confirmed it, People don't get retention offers for teaching and service. Really, like, so you need to find out what your university values and kind of put effort into that. And I think exactly like scheduling time to work on research. Um, one thing that I found just to build upon that is collaborative projects, setting deadlines and expectations for drafts. So then there's an outward accountability to your colleagues. Um, I've been grappling with research now because now that I've gotten tenure, I've tried to get better at mentoring and letting kind of students lead things, which pre-tenure, I was almost like just gung-ho on getting things done as fast as possible. So why would I teach a student how to do it over three weeks when I could do it in a night? But I think that's kind of the luxury of getting tenure affords. Um, but I think, again, the point about universities uh, viewing us as expendable, uh, the fact that we got suspended merit raises while we hired five new ad admin positions kind of reaffirmed that in my mind uh, during the pandemic. I think that's so important, just like the institution wants to extract time from you, like they want your time because they're paying for you. So it's like, well, we have all these random service positions. We have all this time that we can suck out of you and we're going to try to do it as much as we can. You have to have to have to be OK with saying no to things because no one else will do it for you. And I know that's one of the most cliche things you can say, but it's so phenomenal. It's just so phenomenally true, especially when it comes to service. Like as someone who was faced with a lot of service expectations that really derailed a lot of things that I was planning on doing with the first five, six years of my career, I can just say that, you know, I think if I did it all over again, I think I would figure out a way like, like Ethan said, to sort of figure out good in a better way. Like, Figuring out good for teaching, figuring out good for service. If you are very detail oriented and very, and very much a perfectionist, that can be a real challenge. But the earlier you figure that out, the better, because you have to, no one else will do that for you. You have to protect your time on your own. Yeah, I would echo a lot of the strategies that have already been mentioned, work well for me, writing groups, blocking time on calendar. Um, setting up appointment slots that people can sign up for. Um, I think group advising can be helpful. So when I would work with thesis students, I used to I used to set up individual meetings with each one, you know, to check in and now and then I moved to the group model where we'd meet as a group and it just it really made things more efficient. So I would just think of like, where can you be more efficient? Um, I use canned email responses sometimes I have saved all these different templates. And it's not that I don't it's just that when you get the same responses over and over same questions, it's good to have like a template to start from and you just pop it right in there and then you can modify it. That saved me a bunch of time. And that's just time that can, you know, you can contribute to your research. I feel like we can't keep adding and adding and adding every little bit that you can trim from your schedule helps. Um, and I will say saying no is important. I would say, you know, say no to the right things. Like I, it, you know, it's always hard when you see a colleague that like won't adjust their schedule at all because even though a student needs to graduate and have their thesis defense or, you know, have their dissertation defense, but they're, you know, so I think there's times when you have to be flexible and be willing to adjust your research time, but, you know, making sure that you have good boundaries when it's not, you know, absolutely essential, I think is important. Um, trying to think, I, and the other thing I would say is for service, picking your committees carefully. Hopefully you have a department chair who recognizes that you shouldn't be signing up for, you know, if there's university senate that meets once a week for, you know, two hours versus a committee that meets twice a year um, to decide awards for like an hour, you know, 
pick the one that's twice a year. You know, you could do the Senate later when you're, or the, you know, the committee that involves a lot of investment, you could do that later after you get tenure, but just trying to ask people about when you're asked to serve on these committees, what the time commitment is, um, and, and try to pick ways that you can contribute that are not going to suck up all of your time that you need to be spending in your research. I, those are such amazing points. And Amity, just to follow up on that, I think too, it's important to think about service impact versus collecting service opportunities. So I would say fewer number of service opportunities and greater impact to me would be ideal uh, versus the other way around. I'm going to skip to this question because um, I think it dovetails nicely to what we just talked about. And it is regarding COVID um, or taking a parental or family leave and what your thoughts around recommending a stop to the tenure clock versus pushing through? And I think this is sort of a nice follow-up to our question about balance. Pause that clock, take that opportunity. <laughs> it's there for a reason. Like there, if those opportunities are present, it's because there are structures built around it saying faculty deserve this time. You are on parental leave, you're on, you have extra, extra places for flexibility due to COVID. That's exactly why those policies exist. I can't, I could not emphasize enough that like, well, and I can only speak from my context, but I have taken every opportunity I could to stop the clock. And I recognize certainly that there are very heavy gender dynamics associated with that as well, that I took a paternity leave. I, I you know, I, I don't need to exaggerate on, or elaborate on that anymore, but to the, those policies exist. I, you, taking advantage of them is your right and you should absolutely do it. I would agree that you should do it if you need it, but I'll, I'll provide like a different perspective. I would say take the time if you need it, but if you don't, don't, because it can exacerbate those gender and racial inequalities because every year, so, so let's say you have to decide, let's say you had to decide, you know, in June, 2020, and you're in your first year, do you want to stop the tenure clock? And let's say you have until the very end, right before you go up to decide, wait, as long as you can to see if you actually need it, because if you wait that year and you get a one to three percent raise, you know, every year thereafter, that compounds like the lost income over time. And not that it's all about income, but the the gap just gets worse. So I would say, yes, if you need it, that's what those are there for. And certainly everyone should take it. But if you if your committee is telling you, you know, you're where you need to be and, you know, you're going to be fine and you feel like you want to go for it, then I would say go for it, because also every year that you wait, so you don't think that you're vulnerable to being cut in a tenure track position, but at the same time, I think we've heard stories of around COVID, you know, we never know what's going to happen in the future, right? And you do have better protection if you are tenured. And there were cases of universities where tenured faculty had their jobs at risk right around the COVID time, tenure track um, faculty who hadn't yet achieved tenure. So I would just say, if you need it, take it and just consult with other people because it could be tens of thousands of dollars of your career, especially if you end up, if you ended up going into administration or something like that, that's based on your base salary, which every year, you know, so I would just say, think about it, consult your mentors, but if you need it, take it. And if, but if you don't, if you feel like you're in a good spot, then don't would be my advice. I'm doing a stare off. Yeah. Let's see if you want. Um, so I can kind of, I don't know, I can kind of go in between because I think you can't have this conversation without privilege, kind of what Austin was alluding to. So I took paternity leave last after I'd submitted my materials. Um, and I didn't realize it, but there was actually a historical precedent of men abusing paternity leave in my college, meaning that they took it at the same time that their partners did. And their partners presumably did all the child rearing and they just wrote papers. Right. So my wife is also a math professor at Lehigh and Lehigh has a policy where people can't, not that I would take advantage of it because I didn't even enter my mind, but there's a policy baked in that we couldn't take it at the same semester. So I actually was using paternity leave as it was intended, meaning that I was caring for my child the entire day while my wife was teaching and recovering from getting hit by a car, um, for lack of a better phrase, because it was so short, the maternity leave. Um, but I had, like, I had no publications the last semester when I was on. Like I submitted nothing. I just cared. And I got feedback, like, what were you doing kind of during paternity leave and like questioning why I didn't do anything and turn around. Uh, we have a faculty member that took paternity leave at the same time I did and had eight publications under review. So, and he requested to go up early. So basically what I found is that paternity leave and pauses the tenure clocks 
actually functioned pretty differently, meaning men got to accelerate their tenure timeline here, whereas women actually decelerate, like took longer by virtue of definition. So I think it's what I'm saying now is maybe just a preempt for when you all are on the other side of kind of a calling that out and acknowledging it. Um, I tried to, but got kind of yelled down in a meeting saying that I was coming to this conversation without context, but I saw the publication count. Um, I would say kind of to mimic, it's, it's gonna be unique to your own situation. Um, and I think what you can do and what I've done in the past at Lehigh is when you have to do your annual review, you can ask in writing for feedback from the department chair or somebody else about how you're doing. If they're kind of giving you wishy-washy language or you're not really feeling secure in where you are, but beyond just your three-year review or kind of your mid-review, re ask in writing um, for the faculty to comment on your status towards tenure and then use that as a barometer. And I think kind of what Austin talked about, speaking to people outside the university, to maybe look at an eyes, because there's kind of veiled language that people can use and kind of soft blows that people can use when they're kind of setting somebody up for not giving them tenure versus somebody that's cl clearly okay that they're not worried about. But uh, yeah, I think I said in our previous meeting, I wasn't gonna mention this during the recorded part, but I was pretty angered by it um, within my own college and our processes about paternity leave. Yeah, thank y'all for sharing. Um, you know, I agree with pretty much everything that has been stated already. Thank you so much. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and U of A I has my internet oh, just Lindsay or all right, Lindsay. I was gonna um, answer the question <laughs> first. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'll, oh, maybe she got kicked off. Um, I'll, I'll <laughs> continue on, Mel's the host now. Um, yeah, so U of A has like a COVID impact statement as part of like tenure and promotion. Um, and so you can address kind of how it's impacted, you know, your research. And I know there was another question in here about that as well. Um, and, you know, people who do intervention research who are not able to do those things. And so there's like a space to address some of these issues. Um, I know that some reviewers are not as kind, you know, when people have gaps or what they perceive as gaps. So like, why did it take you eight years? You know, if you, you know, whatever the situation is, I, I, I know it's not always just parental leave or you know, COVID, there are a variety of other issues that could lead one to stop their clock. Um, and unfortunately, people are not always, re external reviewers or even committee members are not always kind about those things and what they perceive as what you should be doing. And so I think talking to like your department head um, or dean or whoever is, you know, the person in your college about how to navigate those things. Um, and, you know, I've been on job you know, search committees, right, where you have, you know, associate or full professors applying for jobs. And, you know, people will question like, oh, like, why did it take them so long to get, you know, tenure or things like that. And so, um, you know, there, there's those questions about like how people perceive it, which I think is not always fair. And so having people in the room who can speak up, like, maybe it was parental leave, maybe it was this and not necessarily, you um, you know, a negative thing where some people are, are much harsher um, in terms of assessing that. Thank you all so much. Um, so we're gonna move on to some research focused questions. And actually this one is also related to COVID. And I, I'm just gonna share my screen again. So can you talk a little bit about how you personally or you've seen others pivot or address sort of the impact COVID had on research productivity? Um, is there something specific you would recommend for a statement or dossier to be included? Any thoughts about that? So hopefully your university has a policy already written or something in terms of how they want COVID stuff to be addressed within your within your statement or how a committee should should view the impacts of COVID. Um, if you don't know about that, or if you don't know if your institution has that or not, I would definitely ask whoever the personnel person is within your within your school or department to, to figure out, figure that out. Um, going back to I think Ethan was talking about collaboration, and I just can't emphasize that enough like that has that 
is such a critical avenue for not only building relationships, but also really making sure that your pipeline can continue to be full and distributed well across different stages of the research trajectory. Um, I think that the obvious, the kind of low hanging fruit in response to COVID are things like surveys. I think that there's, I think there's a real danger to that. I think it's sometimes it's necessary, but I think that over relying on, I think that, I think that's important that people think about diff, all the different ways that they could design some experimental work and move, make sure that they can round out their file with more than descriptive stuff. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but I do think that's an important thing to consider. I mean, I can just say, I just named it. I was like, so I was doing Exton analysis and we were doing article coding. We literally couldn't get interlibrary loan to work because people weren't staffing it because they're out for COVID. So I think, again, into what Austin was saying, kind of going beyond that, because I think your university might have the formal statement, but people might not have that in front of them when they're reading your personal statements. So I think not being afraid to actually just say it in your written statement is appropriate. And I'd encourage folks to do that because despite the best of intentions, some of our colleagues aren't that thoughtful and like won't think about the broader university policy or no offense, haven't published more than two papers in 10 years. So they don't really think like they, it's not on their mind. And I think too, kind of again, when you're all on the other side, kind of trying to plant some seeds is this isn't going to impact us for a year or two. Like these are the seeds of five, 10, 15 years from now. If you think about large scale projects or grant funded activities or even any kind of activities. So I think I, I'm, I'm a, I was disappointed in Lehigh's kind of band-aid response that you could apply for, but there's already enough mechanisms in place. So they're pretty much daring people to ask for it. Pretty much arguing that the university was flexible enough already with the number of leaves that they grant. So I think the university stuff's fine in doing that, but just also being real in your statement when you're talking to your colleagues. Um, that would be my two cents. And I, frankly, I was in mine as well. Yeah, I would agree with the recommendations. If your university does allow you to have a COVID impact statement, and this is consistent with the way that they've operationalized that, I would just say being as specific as you can about how it impacted your research specifically. So, and not just directly like, you know, oh, I wasn't able to collect data in the schools because the schools were shut down, but also indirectly. So I know at our institution, temporarily people had higher uh, course loads the next semester. There was a change in the um, teaching loads. There was time spent, you know, shifting courses online. So those aren't directly impacting your research, but it's, it's impacting the time that is supposed to be dedicated to your research. Um, and also just the need to learn new methodologies. So if you were doing intervention research in person and all of a sudden you have to switch to meta-analysis, there is time that it takes to learn those new methodologies. So, and this is another reason why I feel like the, the COVID time stop, it's like, it's almost like, you know, the, you know, certainly take it to need it, but everybody, I mean, honestly, everybody needs everybody. I mean, everybody was impacted differently, but research in general was impacted. So it's kind of a shame that we have to ask to stop the clock rather than just to go ahead and apply when we were supposed to and adjust the expectations. But that's like another story. And it, certainly people were not all impacted the same. That is absolutely for sure. So I still think it's, you know, important to be able to state the case for how your research was impacted. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So our next question is again on the research side here. Um, this question was, should I spend more time on large national public grants um, like IES or NSF or private tech industry style grants? And then how many grants do you, maybe do you apply for in your positions at R1 or R2s? Or how are you thinking about that given the expectations of your institution? Um, I think some people need grant funding to do their work. And so I think thinking about what your research is and whether grant funding is needed to sustain your research agenda um, you know, for the work that I do, I don't need these, you know, huge grants, you know, internal grants have been great. I've applied for foundation grants. Um, I was on a training grant when I worked at Texas State, you know, personal prep grant. Um, but again, like, it really depends on what your needs are. I think sometimes we get the message like you should apply for all these grants and 
it's so important, but I'm currently working on a grant project that is so time consuming, right? And think about when you're junior and if you don't necessarily need it, because you, you know, we have to meet several times a week and it's, it's very, very time consuming. And a lot of times the grants are not funded, right? Of course, if you don't apply, you're not gonna get funded, but being really strategic. And again, going back to what your university requirements are, um, R1, R2, et cetera, can really help you think about like what the priority should be in terms of scholarship. I would agree with that. I would say, you know, even I'm in an R2 and for going up for tenure, it would not at all be expected that you would have applied for external grants. If you do, that's, you know, great. And that's important, but it would not be an expectation um, that that would be a requirement. But even within R2s, I'm sure there's a lot of diversity. So I would just say, consult your, your guidelines. And then I would agree, like, don't just apply to apply for the money, apply because, you know, know what you need to advance your research agenda and figure out what the best source of funding to support that is. And I would say don't overlook contracts to like, you know, partnering with agencies like we've had I've had a lot of success with contracts. So, you know, finding an agency that's interested in your work or an organization and um, so not like a competitive grant process, but um, working together in that way is another option to consider if you have projects that you need to get funded. Austin, Austin, I've got very strong feelings about this. Um, no, I'm uh, I would say, you know, in all honesty, there are there folks that were full at Georgia State and here, even this year, can't speak too loudly again, that got full professor without an external grant as a PI. So I think this is kind of a myth that, you know, we need to be chasing grants as an assistant professor, in all honesty. And the harsh reality that I found when you apply to things like IES and other large external grants is the best predictor of grant grants is previous grants. So unless you're in the pipeline, unless you kind of have the lineage, i.e. you can put an advisor that's gotten 15 grants on your advisory board, it's very difficult to kind of crack that nut. And from what everything that I've encountered or that I've talked to uh, with folks is publications will trump grants nine times out of 10. So you could go, let's say you get an IES grant that's five, six years long, huge budget, great. It's going to take you three years to collect your data, to run your intervention, to actually write the results. And in the meantime, you're gonna have colleagues that haven't sniffed a grant in their entire career, not understand why you don't have more publications, not understanding the things like indirect cost rates, post-award processes, reporting effort, managing graduate students that all take your time up. So to me, I think a general strategy that you can do is if you're interested in getting into the grant game is finding a colleague either outside your university or inside your university that's kind of in that world and then figuring out if you can strategically contribute even as somebody that's like a co-PI or a co-I and kind of just get familiar with that. I was fortunate enough to have that at Georgia State where Andy Roach kind of brought me in. I don't really know anything about PBIS or behavior, but he kind of found niches for me to fill just to kind of get in that world, which can kind of build your success up but not take too much of your time away. Um, but I think it's a really big misconception that you need a, you need a large scale external grant to get tenure. Because I mean, if I'm going to be frank, if unless you're a somebody with a special ed PhD and you went to one of four universities, your success in getting a grant initially is pretty darn low. Um, not to say, cause there's people that have successfully gotten grants here. So I'm not trying to disparage the process, but uh, I got my IES scores and I'm still a little upset. I don't have anything done. <laughs> How can you follow that up? That was excellent. Thank you all so much. Um, so keeping on our theme here, I'm just gonna put it in the chat just in the interest of time, but um, we're talking about research and, oh golly, I just lost my page, here we are. Um, so can you offer advice regarding re-entering um, research? I, we talked about taking a break, but let's say you were in a teaching intensive position and now you're starting a position that's more research intensive. How do you build that research piece? How do you build those collaborations um, either after a break from academia or in a transition to more of a research intensive position? Well, I can speak to transitioning from, you know, one university to another, you know, Texas State is an R2, U of A is R1. Um, but I felt like, you know, I had the mindset of like, 
it was R1. And so I needed to continue to, or even, you know, hit the ground running when I got there and, you know, get seed grant money, you know, start research, publish my dissertation, you know, all of those things. Um, and they really set me up for success to be able to, you know, get hired out of R1 um, and continue like that momentum. Um, and, and something that I'll add that is, you know, kind of related is, um, and Ethan kind of touched upon this earlier too, is when you are transitioning to a university and thinking about, you know, can you bring the years with you, what the policy is around that. And, you know, for me, I needed to be able to bring the years with me or I wasn't going to leave. Um, so I just wasn't about to start over <laughs> after three years. Um, but I, I actually had flexibility here. And so Technically, I started as a first year faculty member when I got to U of A, but they said you can go up what they would consider early at any time versus in my contract stating I was going to be a fourth year tenure track professor. And should something have happened at that time, I would have very little flexibility um, unless, you know, I had a clock stoppage for, you know, one of the acceptable reasons. And so I did use that just in case as a safety net. But I think if you know that you want to go into, you know, a different kind of university, like preparing um, in some ways, and, and it could be hard, you know, I had a 3-3 when I was at Texas State, but some of my classes were like practicum supervision. And so it wasn't a class that met, we met once a month um, and I would do site visits. But other than that, it wasn't very taxing. Um, and I taught a lot of the same classes from semester to semester. So there weren't a lot of new preps after my first year. And so um, just thinking strategically about, you know, your next steps. And sometimes you might not know um, and you may have to start over. And so really thinking about your situation and what is going to work best. I think if you're, I mean, I think collaborations are going to be essential coming back in, getting things going, having some, um, building some momentum rather than kind of waiting to get some ideas flowing. So if you feel like you're not in a place where you have access to those kinds of collaborations, I, I really have just like reached out to people that I've met at like the conferences, like I have new collaborators. I still gain new collaborators just from the unconference from some conversations I had at the unconference, following up with people, um, just talking about, you know, having interest in making sure to have some conversations with them and then following up over email and, you know, and then having weekly calls for, for a while with, with the collaboration I'm thinking of in particular that, you know, it's, it's easy. I mean, it's not easy to be shy about this kind of stuff, but it's, um, you have to kind of put yourself out there and, and ask and just show interest think about common interests and try to build new things. Um, conferences are one really great way to do that. Yeah, I agree with what's been said. I don't have a whole lot more to add. I think because I haven't switched to a different institution nor have I re-entered after a different position, but I think in general, yeah, don't be afraid to, if there's someone whose work you really admire, someone who maybe has some expertise that is related to a project that you're planning to do, don't hesitate to invite them to maybe be a collaborator, be a, um, you know, a co-author, that sort of thing. And, and I think, I would say also think interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, um, there may be people at your institution or aren't in the school psychology program who have expertise or interests that might align with your own. I know when I first started, um, there were some people in different departments that I connected with and I was able to get on their publications and I learned from like how they set up their research teams. And it's just a good experience to see, you know, how others are approaching the research and publication process. Um, and I would say if you have the opportunity to set out like a research agenda for your first year or two, and I think this would be true of anyone, not just as re-entering academia, but I know when I started, I kind of had this document and I had these ideas for these different projects I wanted to work on and I shared it with someone in the department who was a more senior colleague and he looked at it and he said he he basically told me that you know I was trying to put all my eggs in one basket and I had this big project idea but like what if that failed right what if that failed I needed to kind of diversify and could I do a couple of smaller projects while I'm spending a little more time working towards this bigger project and so I was able to kind of re 
calibrate, rethink about that and set some more, you know, have a couple of smaller projects that could be done in a semester or a year as I work towards this bigger project. And I think that was really helpful. So I would just say, don't be afraid to ask for, you know, someone to look at your ideas or give you feedback. And um, if you feel like you're not getting that in your department, like Austin and others mentioned, you know, reach out to others in the school psychology community and see if you can get that. Yeah, the only thing I would add is I think sometimes we view kind of time away from academia as it's this prestigious exclusive club that nobody can get into um, as a deficit. But I think people have that have practical experience and have practiced are immensely valued. And like, I remember I, we ran a search here for a new faculty member and folks that had like two, three, even longer experience working as a school psychologist were highly valued by our students and our fellow faculty. So I think being able, not being afraid to leverage that, like not, don't try to hide that you were a practicing school psychologist, use it. I mean, I'm, I'm just even thinking informally of like reaching out to a school to collaborate. Somebody that was a school psychologist for five years is gonna have way more buy-in instantly than I could ever have. Cause I've been, you know, the privileged academic route cause I knew I wanted to be in academia. And in all honesty, I think too, not being afraid of the challenge in being a professor. And all the hardest year of my career was my internship year. It was like working as a school psychologist, like faculty seems like a cakewalk compared to that. So I think not undervaluing applied experiences and time away is an important thing to underscore here. I have colleagues that frequently remind me that they were out in practice uh, longer than me whenever we're working on stuff together, so. I see. Um, so we have some final thought questions and then we're gonna open it up to our attendees um, to ask questions. So the first one is, and this kind of goes back to an earlier question, but just thinking about those who are starting in their first year this fall, what recommendations do you have for how they structure their time and set them set their path for success um, on the tenure track? One thing that comes to mind is I think the sooner you can figure out the amount of time that you really need to get your course to, to get your courses and get your course prep to where it's okay, that's the time you got to spend. Like it's so easy to get lost in nothing but course prep. You're going to change your course from year to year. You're going to be constantly improving what you're doing expect that it's going to get better and be okay with being okay at first because it's so easy to get that time lost there. I would agree with that and I would also say ask if if possible unless you really want to teach all different courses in the first year like for those of you who are teaching a 222333 see if you can minimize the number of new preps in that first year it is a lot of work the first time you teach a class and certainly you always want to make improvements you know in any class but when you start from scratch especially if someone didn't leave you like a really good solid course to start from so whatever you can do. So if there's like a fall and a spring semester, if it's offered in the fall and the spring and you're able to teach it twice, it, you may think, oh, but I really wanna teach all these other classes and you will, you'll get the chance to over your career, but it really will help if you can just have a few new preparations for your classes um, when you're trying to get your research off the ground. Yeah, if you can get, you know, syllabi, course materials, you know, all of those things, you know, like Blackboard, if you have all the materials from, you know, the course, whatever the um, system is asking for it. And, and you know, I, I know a lot of times we'll offer it to, to new colleagues so that it can make their life slightly easier. I, I do think it could be challenging to teach a class based off of someone's like PowerPoints and things and not knowing <laughs> where they got the material from or where it was going. But I think having at least a foundation to get yourself started is really helpful. Um, having a identifying like a great mentor if you're not already going to be paired with someone, you know, whether it's in your program or your department or college or school um, to really protect you from, you know, people get excited about new faculty and want to rope them into so many things, as I think we've mentioned earlier, and having someone who can say, who can help you say no or who my department chair thinks it's not a good idea for me to take that on at this time thank you for thinking of me keep me in mind for the future you know those have been kind of my canned responses over the year prioritizing like what you really want to do how it aligns with tenure expectations so thinking about how to get your research off the ground if you're just 
coming out of your PhD program, think about publishing your dissertation as kind of a springboard to get started on other research projects. And so advice I was given is like, you know, have some things that are kind of, you know, ready to go for publication. So like your dissertation, for example, have like some new projects you have going on, think about like con conceptual pieces and things. Um, I think those are, you know, a few different things that you can do to, to get started. Yeah, I'm wondering if I could stop the recording. No, uh, one thing that I would add on is what I wasn't in ready for was this idea of interpersonal drama and conflict within departments and academic units. So I had this ambition that, you know, we're all just scholars of the trade in the pursuit of knowledge and we're all going to get along and be friendly and, you know, there's not going to be any bodies buried. That was completely wrong. So I think my recommendation here is for your first year or semester, you don't have to be completely passive, but you might just want to be vanilla on khaki and just be neutral, not get involved in conflicts, not weigh in on stuff and just kind of get the lay of the land of how things are going. Because everybody's on their absolute very, very best behavior during your interview. And they're going to sell it as the utopia of you know, intellectual freedom. But then you're going to get here and you're going to find that it's a pie and there's a zero sum game. And people often use it as resources as being competitive and somebody might have offended somebody three years ago, but then five years ago this happened. So now this person doesn't talk to this person, doesn't serve on this committee with this person. I think just kind of being an observer for a little while and not necessarily, again, I'm not trying to scare anybody that's a first year, but I think just being able to kind of remove yourself and just focus on your own work and focus on yourself and not being afraid to just acknowledge and be friendly with people, but not getting invested in their crap. Um, there's going to be plenty of time for that as the years go on. But there's a whole host of history and back drama that you're not privy to, and your life is so much better for not being privy to it, because you'll get drug into it eventually, unfortunately. I'm just loving all the real talk. This has been fantastic. So the last question is, and I'm just going to post it again in the chat, you know, what is one thing you wish you had known about this process that you didn't know when you were going, going through tenure and promotion? Sorry, I can jump in. I, cause I've, I thought about this question when I was reading it as a kind of assessment measurement person. I think it's important to remember that it's a criterion reference decision, meaning that there's a threshold that you need to go beyond. You don't, relatively speaking, need to be the all-star rock. You don't need to blow the doors off the promotion and tenure process. So I think, again, kind of in line with the good enough and kind of setting personal boundaries is as if you're getting positive feedback and you're giving positive evaluations, having faith in yourself and understanding that it's going to happen. Um, I mean, with I felt like I was relatively pretty productive research-wise, but I was still stressing up until the final provost board of trustees letter, even though I got news from my department, from my college, from my dean, from my provost, I was still freaking out because they tell us the day after commencement here because they don't want people walking out on a commencement. So I think just understanding, and again, it can be therapeutic or it can kind of be maladaptive, but looking at other people that have gotten tenure in your college and looking at their CVs, and if you have comparable accomplishments, then stop worrying if you've gotten positive evaluations after that point. Um, I know it's easier to say on the other side, and I resented people that said the same thing that I'm saying, but kind of taking a breath is what I would say. One thing that I wish I would have known, and this may be different at every institution in every department, but I pretty much until the point I actually went up for tenure was communicating with my department chair, but our, we have a department promotion and tenure committee but for some reason, no one told me or I didn't know, I didn't realize that it was okay for me to talk to them. And this sounds probably strange if you're in a place where the promotion and tenure committee is really advisory capacity. I thought maybe it was a conflict, like, oh, if I ask them for feedback, then maybe I put them in an awkward situation or they think I'm trying to, you know, sway their opinion. But then later I learned when I was chair, no, like the promotion and tenure committee it is, at least at our institution, it is supposed to be kind of an advisory capacity. That's just not how our department was really using it. But so I would say find out, you know, is it okay? And if so, rely on the department promotion and tenure committee, if you have one, to provide feedback along the way. I would get the letter at the third year review, and I got an annual letter from my chair, but I never had any 
when I saw the members, they were all colleagues of mine, but I didn't talk to them about promotion and tenure because I thought maybe I wasn't supposed to, and then later learned, no, you are. So it probably depends on each um, institution and unit, but I would say find out like what is the promotion and tenure committee there only to evaluate, or are they also there in an advisory and supportive capacity? And then if they are, use them in that way or, you know, rely on them in that way. Yeah, I was kind of reflecting on this question last night and I just wrote in my notes, hmm, <laughs> because I, I still don't know like what I'm about to say answers the question. Um, but when I transitioned to University of Arizona, it also coincided with um, the election, right, in 2016. And so um, I had, you know, a pretty terrible experience with a group of students and, you know, they wrote like pretty hateful things in my course evaluations um, and I had them in four classes. And so some of those were smaller than others. And so it appeared, you know, like I was an ineffective instructor. Some of the courses were much larger. And so, um, you know, the small minority of students who were enacting such hateful behavior to put it, you know, lightly were overshadowed right and uh, my department chair wasn't well equipped to um, like support me in that process and so you know I was very concerned going up for tenure although like I felt really secure with my publication record um, but how to address that in my statement in my you know teaching philosophy statement you know because we also have to submit our teaching avals and because I was at Texas State for three years, they didn't ask for those evaluations. They really just wanted to see U of A evaluations for which I just had for two years at that point. And so having to do like this added labor, you know, in my statement, in the teaching philosophy statement, which was separate, right? There are two different statements, adding like research to support that, you know, minoritized faculty, women, um, those who teach courses related to like diversity and equity, like what their experiences are. Um, that certainly was something I was not prepare, prepared for um, and was something that was really stressful on top of a, an already stressful process. Um, and, you know, my department chair tried to be supportive, um, if we want to say that. Um, <laughs> Um, and like, oh, like the committees understand, you know, that minoritized faculty have to go through this, but I'm like, to what extent do they really understand, especially having only been at U of A for two years at that point. And, you know, clearly everything worked out, but it was so much added work for me that I hadn't anticipated on top of, um, you know, spending the amount of time I did already on writing my statement and putting together the rest of my materials. So, I don't know if this completely answers the question, but I do feel like it's important to share and, and you know, in the spirit of being very transparent about this process um, as a minoritized faculty member. I think the only thing I have to add is sort of, it has to do with the tenure and promotion process, but also just we have, uh, every two years we have a merit review and that's tied to steps on our ladder, which tie, are tied to our salary increases and our base salary. And I think that, something I wish I had realized a lot earlier on, you know, I, I thought I had, this is going to sound overly, overly pessimistic, but I thought I had good support within across the school. I thought I had some good sort of cheerleaders for, for myself in, in my files. But I think as the years went on, I realized that other people were getting accelerations. Other people were getting, were asking for more and were getting more with comparable files to me. And I wasn't getting them because I wasn't pushing to go get those. So, and no one was doing it for me. So I think that being thoughtful about, um, you know, if you see something like that happening, if you see, if you think there's an opportunity for you that is that you're not getting because maybe people aren't being as vocal as they should be about advocacy for you. I think that something I've realized is that there are senior faculty out there, whether they're associate or full that are, that want to support you, but are also kind of have kind of figured out their way to navigate a university system. And sometimes that involves just kind of being like, OK, I'm showing up, I'm leaving. But they might be willing to, to step up for you if they know that that's something you want and that's something that you're asking them for. So um, that's my comment.
Thank you all so much. And I am going to stop the recording here. So if you're watching, thanks for watching.